All right, guys, welcome to another G Squared Academy video where you know excellence is epitomized. Continuing in my series um, of planning and designing labs today. So today I'm doing the chemistry. Um, SARL as an indicator, planning and designing lab. That's what we're gonna be going through today. But as usual, before I start, let me thank all those people who have subscribed to the channel. You have liked the videos, you have left a comment. You have shared the videos. Um, thank you very much. I appreciate your support. All right, those people who have not subscribed, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification so you can get one of these videos as soon as I've uploaded it. All right, guys, so let us proceed. So we're looking today at Sorrel as an indicator. All right, so let's look at the problem statement. Ariana was in science class when she heard the teacher say that Indicators are made from plants. She wondered if sorrel or purple cabbage could be used as an indicator like phenolphthalein. Plan and design an experiment to test her idea. So that's what we're gonna be doing today. So that is her problem statement. What is our hypothesis? And again, I pause here to say for those people who don't know the parts of a planning and designing lab, um, or you don't know the things that you should have and what you should have, check out my video on how to write over planning and designing lab trust me it will be helpful okay you can see the link right now in the top right of your screen all right so back to it your hypothesis so our hypothesis is this sorry could can work as an indicator similar to phenolphthalein. we could have said it couldn't work as an indicator as well um it doesn't really matter as long as we take a side and we can test it okay just bear those things in mind we have taken a side and we can test it. So on to the next step. Of course, you know you will need your standard headings. All right, so name G Squared Academy. This is lab number two because this is number two in the series. All right, then now um, the date is there as well. The skill is there planning and designing. The topic now, you'll notice I have ABS, day, uh, um, ABS there, acids, bases, and salts. So it could be acids, bases, and salts because on the acids, bases, and salts, you generally look at the pH, um, pH scale and pH meter, et cetera, et cetera. It could be titrations as well because that's what I'm gonna be doing actually. And you could specify it and say, you're looking at pH of substances, okay? So um, our aim today is to investigate the effectiveness of soil as an indicator. That's really what we're trying to find out, right? So we're moving along nicely. What are the things that we need? Um, you're gonna need 0.1 molar. You could change the concentration, of course, and use whichever concentration. I've chosen this one because this is nice concentration. Um, 0.1 molar, 8CL and sodium hydroxide. You need pipette, pipette filler, burette, phenolphthalein, um, sorrel extract, beaker, conical flask, funnel, clam stand, all of these things that you need, okay? I could have said, I could have been lazy and said titration apparatus um, or colorimetric titration apparatus, which anybody who's doing a colorimetric titration would know what the things you need for that. But I decided to list them out. You should as well and not be lazy. All right, so um, uh, pressing on now. So what is our method now? What are the steps that we're gonna take to solve our problem? Gather your apparatus, first of all, and materials. Then set up the apparatus as shown. It's not gonna be shown immediately now, um, but you'll see it soon, right? You're gonna titrate the HCl against the sodium hydroxide until at least two used volumes differ by point plus or minus 0 0.1. You know how we do in titrations, okay? The used volumes need to differ by no more than 0 0.1, plus or minus 0 0.1, all right? Um, and of course, you notice I say titrate because titrate means something. It's a verb. Titration, it's a verb. It's an action word. That's when you add a solution from a beer to a solution in a conical flask, usually until you get to an endpoint or equivalence point. All right. Then now you record the results. Okay. Um, then you're going to repeat steps two to four using solid, um, soil extract instead of phenolphthalein. So here's our apparatus setup. You see in your burette, you have your HCl. Um, the hydrochloric should be changed to hydrochloric. It should, there should be a H there. You have your clam stand or retard stand. You have your sodium hydroxide with a couple drops of phenolphthalein and it's 25 mils. 
that you're using. So you're basically just going to repeat that using the sorrel extract instead of the um, phenolphthalein. All right. So what are our variables? What are the things that will affect our experiment? So our manipulated variable, or as some people like to say, our independent variable um, is the indicator used. We're actually changing the indicator that we're using here. Okay, what is affected by that change would be the responding or the dependent variable, the amount of HCl needed to neutralize the sodium hydroxide. That is what we're really looking for. That is what will be affected. Okay, then there are a number of things we can keep constant or control. The concentration of the sodium hydroxide, you know, once you're doing the chemistry, the square bracket means concentration of. So concentration of sodium hydroxide, the concentration of the hydrochloric acid, the volume of the sodium hydroxide pipetted needs to be constant for all of them. The number of drops of indicator used needs to also be constant. And the, interestingly, the experimenter needs to be constant as well, because there are certain things that each experimenter, intrinsic things um, that experimenters might have biases towards, or they might have limitation, as you're going to see soon. Okay, so we want to keep those things constant. All right. Now, what do we expect to happen? What do we expect to happen? Remember, you have an hypothesis. You have a hypothesis. You have hypothesized that the soil may be used as an indicator, just like phenolphthalein. That is what you're saying. That's the stance that you're taking. You have to support your stance. Therefore, you're expecting, right? It is expected that soil extract will produce the same average volume of HCl as phenolphthalein. Okay? Because that's what you hypothesize. So you can't say you're expecting um, something different from what you hypothesize. Okay? So you have to support your stance. Next thing now, the data to be collected. Of course, you know here we're looking at standard titration table results. Okay? Standard, there you go, final beret reading, initial beret reading, volume of HCl use, and of course, you have about three trials that you will go through, okay? Um, hopefully, you're good at titrating, and so therefore, you can probably do three at most, um, just a tie break, so to speak, okay? So that's the data that we're going to be collecting, all right? Then now, um, uh, let me just go back a bit and say something about this. We are not doing any treatment of results, so to speak, here, where you'd normally, you know, when you do a titration, you do your calculation to find the molarity of the substance and all of these things. We're not doing any of those things. And what we're really trying to find here is if the use volumes for the phenolphthalein and the use volumes, the average use volume um, is the same for soil and phenolphthalein. So we could actually get that data from the table. So we're not really doing any treatment of data here. All right, so what are some of the things that will limit our experiment? Can't control them. Number one, endpoint error. This really is for students at advanced level and not necessarily CSEC or O level. Um, the endpoint error where you know you have to add extra solution from the beret for you to get a color change. All right, so it's not the equivalence point. Um, it's the end point that you get to where you get the color change. The end point is where the color changes, but not the point where you have equal or stoichiometric amounts of the solution in the burette and in the pipette. So you have the end point error there. Okay. Then your reflexes of the experimental. This is what I was saying. If you change the experimental, one experimental might have better reflexes than the other. They might have intrinsic color blindness. They might have other biases. Okay, so you want to keep the experiment of the same, but then the reflexes of the experiment might limit um, your experiment. Um, the concentration of the indicators may be different. Yes, you may use um, two drops, and that should have been mentioned in the method that you should use um, probably two or three drops of the phenolphthalein. All right, so you could just add that part to the method that you should use specific amounts of the indicator. So even though you're using three drops of indicator, the amount of dye present in that indicator may be different, okay? So that may affect your results, all right? And that's what we're basically saying here, that the concentration of the indicators may be different. Remember, you only need one limitation, generally speaking. So what are some of the steps that you should take 
to protect yourself and to protect your experiments. We know the standard procedure, wear your PPEs, you know, all of these things. Um, but then be sure that you rinse the conical flask. You don't want to leave any residue from one titration into the next. So you need to rinse it. Okay, use the same number of drops of um, indicator for each titration. You can't use four and then use three and use two. That might be problematic, all right? It will be problematic, okay? Read your beer on your pipette at eye level, just in case, all right? You don't want to introduce any parallax error into your results, so read them at eye level. Remember, you only need one um, precaution, generally speaking, all right? Next thing. Um, and I think this is the final thing now are the assumptions that we're making here. What are the things that we're assuming is, is in a certain state here, but they may be different, to be honest. The amount of dye in each drop of indicator is the same. Remember, we said that the concentration may be different, um, but we're going to assume that they're the same. So it doesn't really affect <clears throat> the results in any way. Then no, neither the HCl nor the um, sodium hydroxide react with any of the indicators. You want the HCl to react with the sodium hydroxide, not with anything else. So we're going to assume that they only interact or react with each other and nothing else. Okay. And then if the experimenter is colorblind, because some people are colorblind like myself, it does not impact the experiment. And some, there may be arguments in the scientific community about this, but my stance is simply this. If you are colorblind, then you're going to detect a color change. That color change may not be what someone is who is not colorblind is seeing, but the fact is you have detected that there is a color change. And so therefore, you still would be able to stop your titrating at that point in time. But if the experimenter is colorblind, um, then we assume that it doesn't impact the experiment. If you want to discuss further about this, um, this issue of colorblindness affecting the experiment, no problem, drop a comment. We can always discuss it, you know? Um, so that's it really. Guys, thank you for watching the video. I hope you have found it helpful. I hope it has been useful to you. Please like, share, subscribe to the channel, share the video with your friends. It will be helpful to them in their endeavors, all right? And wish you all the best. I'll see you guys next time.